There are so many things to know when you're pregnant. There are things to do, things not to do, and unfortunately there's a lot of myths out there too. There are. So this week we are going to talk about kind of the 15 most common myths, questions um, that I get as an OBGYN and we are going to share if there's any truth to those as well as debunk some of those myths. Yep, and just in case it's your first time meeting us, I'm Kurt, I'm a board certified pediatrician. I'm Sarah, I'm a board certified OBGYN, currently pregnant with baby number two. And, and we, we are, are the, the Doctors Dr. Bjorkman. Welcome back. As we mentioned this week, we're gonna be diving into some of the common myths of pregnancy because as you may or may not know, we're going through it ourselves. Yes, time number two. So these are things that I hear from patients all the time as an OBGYN or even friends and family with just kind of wondering what's okay. So we thought we would do some myth busting today. Yeah, and just in case you missed it, we went through our first pregnancy week by week detailing a lot of this information kind of in more depth stuff too. So please feel free and go back and check out some of our earlier episodes. Yes. But starting out with myth yes. number one is yes. that when pregnant, pregnant women are eating for two. And while I wish that that were true, um, because I love ice cream, um, the truth is in the first trimester, you do not need any extra calories at all. So this is for me then. <laughs> right. And then in the second and third trimester, you really only need 350 calories. And that is if you started out at a normal pre-pregnancy weight. So. ACOG recommends um, that instead of eating for two, you eat twice as healthy. <laughs> Very cheesy, but I like it. Um, so again, you are not eating for two. You need 350 extra calories in that second, third trimester, which is- Like know, a granola, hearty granola bar. Granola bar. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so myth number two is that cocoa butter prevents stretch marks. All right, well, let's get right into it. So stretch marks are really a genetic thing um, and there are not good studies supporting any product to prevent them completely. Stretch marks affect up to eight in 10 pregnant women. So 80% of pregnant women have some stretch marks. In reviewing the literature, um, we kind of find that there is limited evidence on some different things. And one of them is something called centella abstract um, or possibly massage with bitter almond oil. Um, there's some different belly oils that maybe have almond oil in them. May help prevent some stretch marks um, and or re reduce their severity. There's some other weak evidence that hyaluronic acid may help prevent stretch marks. Um, there is some data that kind of retinoin um, may help reduce severity of new onset stretch marks. Um, however, its use is limited because we don't recommend you use any retinoids, retinols, mm -hmm. retinoic acid during pregnancy. Can be pretty bad for baby and teratogenic, right? That is correct. Okay. So the Cocoa butter and olive oil also have been studied and are not effective in preventing or reducing the severity of stretch marks. Um, basically, studies have kind of concluded that the m reliable methods for preventing stretch marks are pretty scarce um, and the available topical modalities don't really have any great evidence um, from a rigorous or well-defined study. So. Things that seem to be a little helpful are almond oil and then limiting rapid weight gain. Um, but if someone is trying to sell you expensive creams telling you that they will for sure prevent stretch marks, it is just not true. Okay, so if there's something someone likes to use for their skin, probably fine as long as it doesn't have a retinoid in it. But other than that, no strong evidence it's going to help. Right. Okay. Myth number three is that there are lots of ways to tell the sex of the baby based on how you're carrying or the heart rate or other variable factors can help people tell boy or girl without an ultrasound or genetic testing. Yes, so while these are super fun and great baby shower games, um, there is no data to back it up. But you know, I have heard, hey, if you are carrying low, it's a boy. If that initial heart rate is high, it's a girl. And again, such fun myths, so fun to see how it shakes out for you, but zero data 
suggesting they are true. Yeah, I would say each of these ways is correct 50% of the time. Yes, yes, it's true. So, good luck with the game. Have fun. Okay. Uh, myth number four, you, can f you can't fly on an airplane when you are pregnant. Ooh, that is very much not true. You absolutely can fly on an airplane when you're pregnant. Um, and so in that, you know, enjoy your travels. That being said, most OBGYNs and airlines do not want you to fly after 35 weeks or so. Um, because trust me, no one wants you to have a baby on the plane, your OB, your flight attendants, or you. Or the other passengers. Correct. Right? Yeah. So if you do need to travel after 36 weeks, most airlines request a doctor's note, um, stating that you are fit to travel. So also something important is that pregnant women are at an increased risk of getting a blood clot. Um, and so sitting for a long, prolonged period of time also increases that risk. So then we're flying where you're not moving much and you're pregnant at that increased risk of a blood clot. So I always encourage my patients to get up and walk around mm -hmm. on the plane at least once an hour. Get up, walk to the bathroom, just get your muscles and your bodies moving. And that could probably be true for long car rides too. Long car rides, anytime okay. you are sitting kind of not moving during pregnancy, you wanna make sure you get up and keep your body moving. Something else I hear sometimes is that patients seem nervous about, you know, takeoff landing, these changes in air pressure. Like, is this gonna, am I gonna cause my water to break or cause different things? And the answer is no, the cabin is pressurized, okay? So it's preventing any big changes in pressure. The other thing I sometimes hear from patients is that they are worried about walking through that airport scanner, is uh -huh. that safe. And I also, in my first pregnancy, hilariously, very much remember thinking that myself, like, oh, can I walk through this airport scanner? And I remember Googling it and just kind of laughing. So like, you're not supposed to walk through them with a pacemaker or different things. So I, I totally understand where this concern comes from. Um, so is it okay for baby? And the answer is Yes, it is totally safe. The kind of whole body scanner that you are walking through at the airport uses a technology called millimeter wave imaging, and it's designed to pick up potentially dangerous objects that might be concealed under clothing. And so this scanner uses radio waves that bounce off your body and then go back to the machine for processing. This is non-ionizing radiation and uses less than the amount you get from your phone. Number five is that what you eat during pregnancy will affect what the baby likes in the future. So studies are showing us that weight gain and nutritional choices can potentially have long-term impact on your baby's health and development, hmm. but probably not whether they like spicy foods or ice cream. Or apples. <laughs> right. So specifically, children with intrauterine exposure to high maternal dietary inflammation and kind of a lower adherence to a Mediterranean type diet have experienced faster growth rates from early childhood to mid childhood, resulting in higher BMI kind of averages um, in the follow up period is what some studies are showing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And number six, pregnant women should not drink coffee. So, that is false. There is a lot of data on this. So research has suggested and shown that moderate caffeine consumption, which is less than 200 milligrams per day, does not cause miscarriage or preterm birth. Hmm. And so that's the amount in one 12 ounce cup of coffee. Remember that caffeine is also found in tea, chocolate, energy drinks, and soft drinks. Interestingly, kind of hot off the press, JAMA published a study in October that really showed that it is possible that moderate amounts of caffeine consumption during pregnancy may lead to children who have a shorter height, kind mm. of between ages four and eight. And so this is something that they are looking at long-term. They don't know if this persists beyond age eight, but this study did show perhaps moderate caffeine exposure in pregnancy may lead to shorter um, heights for children. And studies have also, also shown that more, you know, higher doses of caffeine um, potentially can lead to small for gestational age 
babies. So that mm. is why the current recommendation on what ACOG recommends is 200 milligrams of caffeine or less to, de to be determined if that number should be even lower in the future. Yeah, and I think some of the challenges of these studies is they are showing associations, not necessarily causes. And I think the difference in heights between those four and eight year olds was at most about an inch between the mom's levels of consumption of coffee. So, right. so interesting thought. We'll continue to follow that data as it comes out from those um, National Institute of Child Health Studies. Okay, great. Myth number seven is that pregnant women should not eat hot dogs or other deli meats. So there's some truth to this one, um, but it's not a hard no. Okay. So there's a very small risk of getting an infection called listeria from deli meat, hot dogs, in fact, some other canned fruits, even ice cream, okay? The risk is very small, um, but to avoid that risk, you can just heat deli meat or a hot dog until they steam. So you okay. can still eat turkey, you can still have your hot dog, whatever makes you happy to be 100% safe, heat it in the microwave for 60 sec 30 to 60 seconds until it steams. Yeah, and there generally are kind of a couple outbreaks of wisteria in the US kind of in little pockets every year. And so it's also good just to pay attention to your local news um, if these are particular foods you really like to consume. Yes. Okay. Uh, myth number eight is that pregnant women shouldn't eat fish when pregnant. Also not true. Fish is an awesome food to eat when pregnant. You just yeah. need to be careful and thoughtful about the type of fish you are eating. Um, you want to avoid fish that has a high mercury contact content. And we th that is really, we see that in big fish that eat other fish. So mackerel, shark, swordfish, big eye tuna, things like salmon, tilapia, whitefish, other shellfish are great and recommended to eat two to three times a week. Okay, awesome. Don't eat the giant fish. Right. Okay, cool. Uh, myth number nine is that pregnant women shouldn't pet cats or change kitty litter. So. This is also false, um, but again, based in some truth, so let me elaborate. Okay. It is possible for cats to carry a disease called toxoplasmosis, and this is an infection that moms could theoretically get and then pass to baby while pregnant. Yeah, which ends up being pretty bad for babies. It baby can too. potentially be very devastating for a fetus. So. When a cat is initially infected, the toxoplasmosis infective cysts are passed in cat poop. Hmm. After that, cats get immunity and don't get reinfected. But in theory, if you got cat poop on your hands when they were initially infected, and then you got said cat poop in your mouth, um, you could potentially get toxoplasmosis. This is rare because number one, this infection is only found in cats who go outdoors and hunt prey. So mm -hmm. mice and other rodents. So if you have an indoor cat who only eats cat food, doesn't have contact with outside animals, your risk of toxoplasmosis is very, very, very low. Yeah. The other thing is you are most likely not getting cat poop on your hands when you clean the litter box. And if you do, you are going to carefully and completely wash it off. So the risk of getting toxoplasmosis is honestly much greater from eating undercooked meats. Um, so to be ultra safe, you can wear gloves while you are changing the litter box, or you know you are pregnant, great excuse to make your partner do great it. Great excuse to make your partner do it. You do not have to tell them that I debunked this myth. Um, but to avoid getting toxo in general, avoid undercooked meat wash all of your vegetables and fruits thoroughly, and then wear gloves um, or wash your hands really well after working outside in the dirt. Okay, awesome. Myth number 10 is that pregnant women shouldn't lift weights, run, or do heavy exercise when pregnant. And that is a myth, 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 myth. Exercise is one of the best things you can do for your health and your baby's health mm -hmm. while you are pregnant. Absolutely. We have an entire episode about exercise and pregnancy, all the recommendations from ACOG and the other organizations, um, tips, all sorts of things. So check that episode out. Exercise is so great in pregnancy. Check it out. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Myth number 11 is that you shouldn't sleep on your back when pregnant. Ooh, so. You should sleep however you are comfortable okay. <laughs> is the truth in that. And let's talk about where this myth comes from. So number one, you may find that later in pregnancy that sleeping on your back just isn't comfortable 
for you and, and that's okay. And so more of the physiology behind this myth is that as your uterus grows and you lay on your back, that uterus may compress those big blood vessels that run along your spine, specifically the inferior vena cava. Mm -hmm. However, if that those blood vessels were be, to become compressed and there was decreased blood flow back to your heart when you were awake, you would notice that mm -hmm. you didn't feel well. You would feel nauseous. You would feel lightheaded. And if you're sleeping, your body reflexively also senses that and changes position. Um, so I just keep seeing this ad on Facebook for this pregnancy pillow and it says, it's the only pillow that kept me from rolling onto my back. And I'm just like, who cares? It's fine to sleep on your back. If you wake up in the morning on your back, don't panic. Your baby is fine. Awesome. So speaking about sleep, uh, myth number 12 is that sex during pregnancy can hurt the baby. <laughs> uh, I, I always, sorry, I just laugh at that one because I am sure that myth started with some man with a very inflated sense of ego. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, unless you have some pregnancy complication or contraindication where your doctor says you need pelvic rest, um, AKA avoiding intercourse. Um, and this is often for things like a placenta previa, a shortened cervix, potentially you've had bleeding during pregnancy and things like that. Otherwise, it is okay and safe to have sex when you're pregnant. The uterus is a big, strong muscle mm -hmm. that is surrounding that baby. And then within that big, strong muscle, baby's kind of floating in a cocoon of fluid. And the cervix is kind of this neck um, that of, at the bottom of that uterus and is three to four centimeters long during pregnancy. And so your baby is far away, far away and very safe from yeah. anything in your vagina. Yeah. So okay. feel free to use the time to connect with your partner. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, myth number 13, uh, you can't dye your hair when pregnant. Nope. Totally fine. See these really old highlights need to be redone totally fine when you are pregnant. Um, there is no evidence that people with, you know, normal scalp integrity have any concern that hair dye soaks into their head and passes to the baby. It is just not a thing. Get your hair did. Enjoy whatever makes you feel good. Okay, cool. Okay, down to our second to last myth. Mm -hmm. Number 14 is that eating spicy foods will induce labor be great. Just throw some hot sauce on something and go into labor. Um, unfortunately, there isn't any food, supplement, or activity, including sex. Um, no, that doesn't help. That will induce labor. We do have medications that can we can safely use, but there are no proven natural remedies to induce labor. Okay, and finally, number 15 mm -hmm. is that natural birth is better for my baby. Thankfully, no. Um, and I think that natural in this sense, when people say things like this, refers to a medication-free vaginal birth. And I think for some patients, yes, this is a wonderful thing. Totally wonderful. Um, and I know for some patients who want medication, that is also a wonderful thing. Um, studies have shown that epidurals and other pain control are safe for mom and baby. So it is really important to have a discussion with your doctor about your goals for your birth and how the team can help support you accomplish those goals. You want to have a medication free birth? Absolutely go for it. Work for it. Prepare for it. It's amazing. If you want an epidural, also awesome. Go for it. Get your epidural. Um, yeah, so. and there is a little bit of data about the differences in how babies do after vaginal birth versus C-sections that are all pretty small numbers in terms of does baby benefit at all from going through the birth canal and getting kind of the stress of that environment, helping them have lower rates of some kind of mild, limited respiratory distress, et cetera, after that. Um, again, all of these are not major factors, and at the end of the day, you probably don't have a whole lot of control over whether you have a vaginal or C-section birth. but. This right. question was really about medicated versus not. Right, and so our goal as your care team is to, of course, empower you and help you have the birth experience you want, ultimately keeping mom safe and baby safe, and that looks different for every patient. So awesome. that was some of the, the 15 most common myths 
please share with us in the comments other myths you've heard that you think we should debunk. Leave them in the comments. Share some of the wild stories you've heard. Um, and otherwise, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. We're doctors. But not your doctors. Anything we've said in this video is for education or entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice. Any specific medical questions you have should be directed to your provider.